Okay, we've studied in this series, what is God like? Um, We've studied attributes, and remember, attributes, not a word we use that often, but it is a quality, character, or characteristic ascribed to someone or something. So these are character traits, qualities of God. And we studied omnipotence, he's all-powerful. Omniscience, all-knowing. Omnipresent, he everywhere. Love, holiness, goodness, and tonight we're going to study about his justice. We're going to learn about the attribute of justice. A.W. Tozer has another great quote, which is, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God, the most important thing about us, period everything about us, that's what matters because what we believe God is like is going to just radically change us either for good or for bad. And we want to know what he's really like, not what somebody's taught us, not what our feelings tell us, but what he is really like. And the place we find that is in his word. He tells us what he's like. And he can't lie. Every word in this book is true. It's awesome. And I want our minds to think as rightly about God as we possibly can while we're still in these jars of clay. No matter how much we study, no matter how much we even pray and get to know God, I truly believe the day we meet Him in all of His glory, we're going to know we have only scratched the surface. That day is going to be so awesome and amazing. And I think he wants to let us know as much as we can on this side of eternity. And I want to go as far as I can to y'all. I don't want to hold back. I want to be like, (laughs) and I put in here, Lord, let us see you as much as we can so we can worship, worship and adore you accordingly. We can never truly be happy outside of knowing what God is like. Jesus told the woman at the well, but the hour is coming. This is in John 4. The hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. We cannot worship Him in this way if we don't really know Him. And when we start to understand what He's like, worship will be the natural outcome. It will become as natural as breathing to us. We will worship God when we start to know what he's like deep inside. And we have to remember this. I have to tell myself this. You're going to have to tell yourself this, that when God or his word seem harsh, seems harsh or unfair, the problem lies within us. It's not with God. We don't have a, it's because we don't have a correct understanding. God is never unduly harsh. Never is he unduly harsh. His judgments are never knee jerk or irrational. How many of us had parents that you couldn't, you know, you were just scared to death to move because something might happen? And that gets in our mind that God's like that. He is not like that at all. He's always good and he's always righteous and just, which means right and fair, always. A synonym for justice is fairness. And this is Hosea 14, 9. It says, who is wise? Let them realize these things. Who is discerning? Let them understand. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. When I feel rebellious against what God says in his word, I ask him to help me understand. Does anybody ever read something? You're like, oh, that's harsh. Oh, oh, I don't know about that. And I have to go, God, help me because I'm not understanding what you're meaning. I can't see the whole story. Help me understand. And I'm going to tell you, I even asked God, in 2010, I've got it all written down. I was like, God, why did you? And I'm not going to explain it here. I did a sermon on it one time. But I asked him, I said, why did you make hell? Why didn't you just let people be destroyed? And throughout the day, I believe he actually taught me. And I wrote it all down and did a whole thing on it because God wants to tell us things when we ask him. He's not, he wants to tell us things. We're his friends. He wants us to pray about things and let him show show us because I truly didn't understand. I wasn't judging him over it. I just didn't understand. And he wants, he wants to help us. 
When we come to him with a humble heart, believing in his goodness, he will go to any length to help us understand him. He wants us to know his beautiful heart. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. I'm sharing some of my just favorite scriptures tonight. Listen to what it says. It says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. The Lord delights, and that means he takes great pleasure in kindness, justice, and righteousness. God wants us to take great pleasure in his justice also. It shouldn't scare us. It should be a great comfort to us. Justice for the believer, if you're a Christian, justice for the believer is different than justice for the unbeliever. And I didn't mean for all this to line up with Jordan's sermon on Sunday, but it kind of does. <laughs> um, so C.S. Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon said it best. Listen to this, and I want you to hear me. God never punishes his children in the sense of avenging justice. He chastens or disciplines as a father does his child. But he never punishes his redeemed as a judge does a criminal. It is unjust to exact punishment from redeemed souls since Christ has been punished in our place. How shall the Lord punish twice for the same, for one offense? How would he punish twice for the one offense? He won't. So we're treated different when we're God's children Justice works in us as discipline. For the unbeliever, it is God's justice. It is exacting from them what's right. So nothing destroys a child like injustice. Anybody ever heard a little child say, it's not fair? Anybody ever felt that as a little child? It is a devastating thing. With my own kids, I knew that they wouldn't have justice in this world but I was like, you will have justice in this house. I made sure that if a six-month-old took something out of the three-year-old's hand, I didn't say, you're older, give it to your six. I would say, no, to the six-month-old, take it out. And the older one would go, okay, I'm done. They can play with, I mean, they thrive when things are right and fair and just. And think of us, injustice destroys me, does it you all? Can you stand it when something's been done that's not right? I mean, have you ever watched a movie and the bad guy just gets shot in the head? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. There's just something inside of us. I know just, there's um, producers around and stuff, but I'm like, oh, that was so satisfying. So <laughs> how do we even know as a child what fair is? I'm going to tell you. The reason justice lies so deeply within our souls is because we were created in the image of a God whose throne rests on two things. Listen to this, Psalm 97, 2. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. That's why we care so much about justice is because we're made in his image, and justice is foundational to who God is. You can't separate God and justice. Foundation. So if, it, if it's his foundation of his throne, I'm going to read what foundation is. The basis or groundwork of anything, the moral foundation of both society and religion, the natural or prepared ground or base on which some structure rests. So this, again, foundational to who God is. That's why we can't stand it. It's just deeply embedded in us from the time we even are aware of our surroundings. We can't, I I look at my grandchildren. If I bring something to one and don't bring it to the other, they're devastated. Immediately, they're like, where's mine? I accidentally gave Gain something the other day, a hat. Didn't even think about poor little Axel, so I had to grab a hat and take it to Axel. So I'm gonna have to do that for four kids soon. I'm just gonna have to quit buying gifts is what I'm thinking. (laughs) So everything about God's throne starts with two truths, the righteousness and justice. 
He is always right. He is always fair. And we need those things desperately to be emotionally healthy. We all do. Every word in this book is right and it's fair. And I'm going to tell you something. Every piece of the law, I've, I've been plowing through Leviticus and Deuteronomy and all that. Every bit of that is actually beautiful. It only brings death to us because we can't carry it out because we have a sin nature. But I look at Jesus's life. He lived out the law naturally as a man because he was righteous. We'll never be able to do that. So Jesus came. We don't have to live under the law. But even God's law is beautiful. It brings death to us because of our nature, but it's a beautiful thing because it's God's law. Everything God did in the Old Testament was right and fair. And there's a lot in the Old Testament. When you read it, when I used to read it, I would be like, oh, but the longer I've known God and the more I've gotten to know the history of things, the more of archaeological, archaeological things that have been found, the promised land that he gave them, the wickedness of the people, the fact he gave them the hundreds of years he did before he drove them out and destroyed them, his patience and his mercy is unbelievable. But everything he did in the New Testament was right and fair. He has a reason for every single word in the Bible. He has a just reason for every single act he's ever done. Again, when I rebel against something in his word, it is simply because I lack understanding. He is good through and through. Tell yourself that over and over again because we want to often judge God by what he allows or what we see in the world. He is good. There is no darkness in God. His intentions are good. Everything about him is good, and he is loving through and through. When we hear justice as an attribute of God, we want to soften it. And let me tell you, no, we don't. We don't want to. All of God's attributes are equally beautiful. If we would truly know him, it will have to be as he is and not as we would prefer him to be. His justice is the reason Christ had to be physically beaten beyond recognition, crucified, our sin being laid on him. Can you imagine when Christ had to become sin, who there's no darkness in him, there's no sin. Can you imagine what that was like? For I, We can't imagine what it was like. All the sin of the world to put on, be put on our Jesus. God had to turn away from him. He had to experience physical death. All that, but it was because God's justice has to be, the count has to be zero. Everything has to be paid for. Romans 3, 25, 26, every sin has to be paid for. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Atonement really means at one -ment. We get to be one with God, reconciled to him. Through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance or in his patience, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. I don't know if you realize this, but every sin was still in existence when Jesus came. From the first sin when Adam and Eve took a bite of the fruit to the very last sin that was committed before he died on the cross, every sin was still there. It was just covered by the blood of goats and bulls. And when Jesus came, guess what happened? The sin's gone. It's not covered now. It's gone. That's why we can have a clear conscience. I can hardly remember all the crap I did, and it was a lot. <laughs> he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. God is just, and then he came down and he justified us. And listen to what justification is. Let this be just medicine to your soul. Justification is that gracious and judicial act of God whereby a soul is granted complete absolution or forgiveness from all guilt, how much guilt? All guilt and a full release from the penalty of sin. It doesn't matter what we did, we get a full 
through the blood of Christ and His suffering, God's justice was satisfied. We get a full release from the penalty of sin. That's Romans 3, 23 through 25. This act of divine grace is wrought by faith in the merits of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a God. Because of that, we can love God's justice. Justice is the foundation of his throne, so justice is one of the ways that God operates in our lives. These things are hard for us sometimes because we don't understand how kind God is being toward us when he corrects our wrong or irreverent views of him or even our actions. When we understand who he is, our hearts become moldable and humble. When we understand he is fair or just, we will trust him on a level we can't imagine. It will make life bearable, and I'll explain that more as we go. Our hearts can be at rest. His justice is an attribute we desperately need to know that God's commands, if we don't know his justice, his commands can make us bitter and feel like a failure. Let me explain. Jesus told us some hard things that we're to do as his followers. And I'm only going to use one, Luke 6, 27 and 28. But to those of you who will listen, I say, and this is Jesus himself, love your enemies. Mm. Do good to those who hate you. What? Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. Hurt, hate, curse, mistreat. I'm supposed to bless, pray, and love. What? That's not fair. No justice. How can a just God ask us to do this? There's many reasons. I'm only going to go through one here. We can be kind to people who are horrible and even love them because justice will be done in every situation eventually. If our enemies don't come to Jesus, and if they're not a Christian, because Christians can be enemies, unfortunately, if our enemies don't come to Jesus, they will pay for every single sin they have ever committed. They will suffer for eternity in hell, just as we would if we had not come to Jesus. If we believed in God's justice, praying for them might cease to be so hard. We would have a heart cry the same as Jesus. Luke 23, 24, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Do we think anybody would really live this life without Jesus if they really knew what they were doing and what their eternity looked like? Wicked people have no idea what awaits them for eternity. God wants us to know they won't get away with it. And our love for them and our prayers may change their eternity. Sometimes when people are really awful, you might be the only person praying for them because most people are going to have nothing to do with them. So remember that. I have to remember this because I have, my knee jerk is to just get mad um, and not like somebody and think, you need to go on. Um. Their treatment of us, if we will believe in God's justice, will change us and make us like Jesus. If if somebody does all those things to us, and in return, we believe him, and we know what their eternity looks like, and we start to cry out for them, knowing how horrible it's going to be, and we say, God, give me your love for them. Give me your heart cry for them. Do you not think that's going to change you? It's going to make us like our Father. He We will have these people in our lives. He said, pray for your enemies. Would he have said that if we weren't going to have any? No, we are going to have them. So either way, we can win in this situation. We are never, ever a victim when we are God's child. Never. You may feel like it, but you are not. Do we see an example of this in Scripture? I'm glad you asked. I know this scripture by heart pretty much, but I still find it so difficult because of my own unbelief. I loved what um, Irene said last week when she said, I believe, forgive my unbelief. How many times we got to say that? Because if I believed stuff, I would just do this easily, (laughs) but I don't. 
We all hate injustice, and believing in God's justice is the only way we will make it through this hard world and maintain a soft heart. I believe it's the only way. It's how Jesus did it, so this is crucial. 1 Peter 2, 19 through 23. For it is commendable, and I want to tell you what that word commendable means. It means praiseworthy, okay? So, for it is praiseworthy if someone bears up under the pain, does it hurt, of unjust suffering? Does unjust suffering hurt? Yes. <laughs> endure is a word like you got, it's not easy. You endure the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God, because they know God's there. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is from Jesus, or this is from Peter talking about this. Um, If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is praiseworthy before God. Listen to what he says, to this you were called. Guess what our calling is? To endure unjust suffering. Because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example. Aren't you glad we have a God that knows how we feel? At times, I don't know how I would have made it if I'd have thought, you don't know how I feel right now. He knows how I feel. He knows how you feel. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Okay, let's just think about this on a real level. He's Jesus. What could he have done? You're dead. Wipe out the whole place. You're, you know, he could have called down fire from heaven. He could have done anything. They hurled insults at him. He made no threats. Instead, listen to what he did. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. When God looks down at our situation, somebody may lie about us, somebody may have a different point of view, only God sees exactly what happened, and Jesus entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Let me tell you what that word in Greek means, entrusted. He entrusted himself to give over, to hand over from, to deliver over with a sense of close personal involvement. We can hand ourselves over to God when we are enduring unjust suffering. He is intensely personal with his children. Even if someone kills us, they will not escape the justice of God. You think about Herod. He had John the Baptist killed. And then later, when Herod accepted glory that belonged to God, he killed him on the spot. God killed him on the spot. It looked like Herod won when John's head was delivered as a joke to all those sinful people. I mean, John the Baptist, no greater person born among women than John the Baptist, and God let his head get cut off and delivered on a platter to a bunch of sinful people. God took it very seriously. Justice was done. I'm gonna ask you a question. Who won that battle, John or Herod? John went to heaven. Herod's in hell today, right now, in this moment. That's where he is. Did John see justice in this life? No, but justice will always be done. We can know that for sure. Jesus could endure anything because he knew in the end his father was watching every single thing and he judges justly. He also knew that the end of those people was going to be eternal torment and he did not want that. When we believe in hell and God's justice, it will completely change how we view what happens to us down here. We can look at the worst of the worst and pray for them and love them because our scales of justice inside can stay balanced. When someone does something, and listen, I'm preaching this to myself. I'm not good at this yet. I hope to get better. But when somebody does something, we don't have to feel these scales just get all unbalanced like, oh, they're winning. They can stay balanced because God hears us, God knows what's happening, and God will take care of things. When I feel like a victim and that God doesn't care or, or see that see what I'm going through, I can get all warped out of shape, and instead of loving my enemies and blessing them, mm-mm, hating and cursing. We have to get this attitude of God pressed deeply into our psyches in order to even start living a real and victorious Christian life. 
I watched God's justice in action 25 years ago. My good friend, and some of y'all may know this story, Denise was murdered by her husband. I'll never forget, my son turned 10 that day. He's 35 now. And he turned 10. It was his birthday, August 12th. He choked her to death and burned the house down around her while he crouched outside with their kids, two, four, and six. I was devastated along with my little town. Doug was her husband's name, and he was not convicted because there wasn't enough evidence to bring him to trial. I only know about the choking and everything because of the trial. I couldn't understand how this was happening, so I fasted and I prayed. Get into action. When something happens, go to God, fast, pray, talk to Him. God wants to get involved in our situations, but we have not. Why? Because we ask not. I mean, how many things are we going to see that God wanted us to be involved with, but we didn't ask Him? So I was in contact with Denise's sister, and the story is way too long to tell. But since God let me be involved, He took me into His confidence. God tells His friends things, and it's the greatest gift in the universe. And guess what? He calls us friends. When we know Him, we are His friend. So Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you don't know. The New Living Translation, I love, same verse. It says, ask me and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. How can God tell us that? Because he knows, (laughs) he knows what's coming. So I was fasting and praying that morning. And I've told y'all I'm not the greatest faster, but God, by about 10 o'clock in the morning, he knows I'm dying, so he starts answering. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, Lord, get me through. It's 10 o'clock a.m. <laughs> Kids started looking like a chicken. It's <laughs> just the truth. <laughs> it's true. Okay, bring it back in. Okay. So he spoke to me that morning out of Psalm 79. I was just reading through my Bible like I normally do, but my heart wanted to help in any way. And we didn't know for sure if he was guilty, but it looked very suspicious. So I'm reading, and I, and I just can't understand why all this is happening. Those little babies got out with just the little clothes on their back. It was awful. And I read this out of Psalm 79:10. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Before our eyes make known among the nations that you avenge the outpoured blood of your servants. And I was like, what? In the New Testament, the word avenge means it's translated from a Greek word to do justice. So he does justice when his servants have their blood outpoured. So he let me, da- let me know he was going to take care of it and her blood would be avenged. So I kept reading. I was blown away. I kept reading. Um, Psalm 79, 11, the next verse said, May the groans of the prisoners come before you, but with your strong arm preserve those condemned to die. And I thought, he just told me Doug's going to prison. I'm like, what? And then I went on. And I read Psalm 79, 13, the last verse. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever. From generation to generation, we will proclaim your praise. And I believed he told me, I believe he told me that Denise was, or that Cheryl was gonna get those kids, Denise's sister, and they were gonna recount his praise from her generation down to that generation and tell those kids what God did. I knew this meant that she would get the kids and I, I did all this in a podcast called Can God Walk You Through a Murder? And I'll, when I post this, I'll post it in the comments so you can see the whole story. That was 25 years ago, and Doug was convicted of murder. He is currently a prisoner, and Cheryl raised his kid, her, her kids. And I remember when I told her this, I said, I feel like God has spoken to me. I was very terrified to tell her that because the Bible says if you... Uh, say God told you something and it doesn't come to pass. You're a false prophet and you're supposed to be stoned. So I took it very seriously. I didn't say, this is a word from the Lord. I said, I think I've heard from the Lord. But, and I remember telling my husband, I sat there with him because I put it on note cards because I thought nobody's gonna believe this. When this happens, nobody will believe me. So I dated three note cards, showed my husband. He said, Terry, that is never gonna happen. He said, he got away with it on this side. He'll pay for it in eternity, but that is never gonna happen. We haven't. Um, (laughs) 
<laughs> God's awesome. When God gets involved, everything changes. He didn't stop Doug from killing her, but he did not let it go. He rose up. He fought for her and her children by removing that evil man from all their lives. Those children got to grow up in a wonderful home far away from their dad. God's ways are not our ways, but they are right and just. Denise's life was taken, but I can tell you, she was one of the best mamas I've ever known. She would have gladly given her life to protect them from their daddy. And if he hadn't, if he hadn't have done that, I mean, only God knows, but I don't know what kind of life they would have had. When we were waiting on a verdict, Cheryl, Denise's sister, called me from the courthouse and she said, we're waiting. She said, I need a scripture. And my daily reading that day was Psalm 94. So I said, Psalm 94. And she said, somebody else gave me that same scripture. So the first two lines of that scripture, listen to this. The Lord is a God who avenges, a God who avenges, O God who avenges, shine forth. Rise up, judge of the earth, pay back to the proud what they deserve. It was a long psalm, Psalm 94, and it was taken so long. She said, give me a scripture. She went in the room where they were waiting, read the whole scripture, and right after she finished, the verdict came down, guilty, and he went to jail. Won't he do it? (laughs) I saw God's invisible hand move through that experience in ways that shaped the rest of my life. God's justice is real. It let me know he can tell us anything. It made me know he can walk us through anything. It made me know he is a good father and he will fight for his children. God's justice is beautiful. And listen to this in the New Testament, Romans 12, 19 and 20. Oh, Lord, this is so hard for us to remember when things are happening. Do not avenge yourselves. Ooh, but don't it feel good in the moment? Yes. Do do not avenge yourselves, beloved. And I love that he calls us beloved because he knows we want to avenge ourselves, but he said, don't do it, beloved. But leave room for God's wrath. So you're wanting to avenge yourself. Just back up and say, this is your room, God. (laughs) I'm gonna let you have this room. Leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. If it's his, does that mean it's not yours? Right, it is his. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. So he's like, while you're waiting for me to take vengeance, just be nice. It'll make them mad. (laughs) Hebrews 10.30, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. If we avenge ourselves, we may very well stop God from doing what he would have. We are to take what he says seriously. We can be kind and loving. I was kind and loving to Doug. when Every night when my kids and I would pray beside their bed, I would pray for him. And I still hope that that scripture means that he will save him. Short, quick story. Um, I wanted to send him. I wrote that whole story down. I was going to put it in my book, but the family didn't want it in my book, so I didn't. I wrote the whole story down, and I wanted to send it to Doug, but I had no idea where he was, not no idea what prison he was in or anything. A friend of mine from my little town came to see me after I hadn't seen her for probably 15 years, and when we were talking, she said she worked for the prison system, and guess who she knew where he was? Doug. So I sent it to him. The kids are like, you did What? He's going to come kill us. <laughs> I'm like, don't worry, we're fine, hopefully, or maybe not. But, but God let me send the whole story to him so he could see what God had done after he killed her. He still denies it, but it doesn't matter. He can't unread it. Nothing escapes our good father. We can love and pray knowing God's way to deal with people and us is perfect, all of us. Oh, the peace of mind he wants to give us if we would believe this. So what do we do with all this? We live in a world where not much is fair. God's justice tells us this. Run to me and tell me all about it, just like a little child. What God says back to us is, I've heard you and I'll handle it. Rest, my child. Just as Jesus was treated horribly, much worse than anything we'll go through. He didn't retaliate. He left justice to him who judges justly. By faith in his justice, we can do that too. 
My dear friend Alicia and I talk a lot on Marco Polo and we share what God's t- teaching us. And we both have talked about how we feel if somebody hurts our kids or anything. I mean, it's just, you know, talking back and forth. And she was like, well, I want to burn their house down with them in it. (laughs) And everybody can laugh and judge, but who doesn't? When somebody hurts your kids, how do you feel? I mean, seriously, we do. I mean, I have to pray and let God help me, but that's your kind of knee jerk. And then she sent me one back and she said, it hit her. One day, God the Father will burn up all the people who mistreated his son. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Justice for the believer is a soft pillow to put our heads on. Justice for the unbeliever is a terrifying reality. Just like the people who mistreated God's son won't get away with it, the people who mistreat us won't get away with it. Believe that. All sin will be paid for in the end. Not one mean look, word, betrayal, adultery, murder, Fill in whatever injustice is being done or has been done to you. None of it has slipped by God. None of it has. Justice will be done, and hell is horrible. I take no glory in that. I take no, um, God doesn't take any pleasure in that. It says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He made hell for the demons and for, for Satan and demons. He never meant for us to have to be there. That does not please God to do that. But justice will be done, and either we will pay for our sin or Christ will pay for our sin. Knowing this is the reason it makes perfect sense that Jesus told us vengeance is his and he will repay. So we should do everything in our power to pray for those people so they don't have to go there. We should be kind when we are mistreated. We're here to bring people to Jesus, to know God love him and love others and be a conduit for God to touch people. How many people that mistreat us might end up coming to Jesus if we will have that reaction back to them? What if we're kind to them? What if we bless them? What if we pray for them? And what if we actually love them? You can't see love, but genuine love, you know it when you feel it. Even a wicked, horrible person when there's genuine love. You think about the thief on the cross. He was, both of them were insulting and hurling insults at Jesus. But one of them was watching him, watching him love the people. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Looking at John saying, care for my mother. All the things he was doing, the kindness and the way Jesus died and what was pouring out of him, that was a wicked man. Wicked enough to hurl insults while he's being killed. It changed his eternity because of the reaction of Jesus Christ. What might he do in our workplaces, in our homes, in all the places, in our churches, if we actually love people and pray for them and bless them? Because we can know God's going to take care of it. If they mistreat us, if they don't come to him, that's going to be taken care of. We don't have to pay anybody back for anything ever. We entrust ourselves to God who judges justly and we can endure unjust suffering like Jesus did. He left us that example to follow in his steps and we can endure it because what we know of God's justice. Let's pray. Father, oh my goodness, your attributes, who you are, the more we know them, the more beautiful you are. You are perfect. You are holy. Everything you do is good. And your children are so safe with you. Even if we're not physically safe, nothing touches us that has not gone through your hands, that you're not working. Just like my friend Denise, God, you worked that together for good. You did not save her life, but you saved her children. You removed her, removed them from that wicked man, and you've done a beautiful thing. Only you can work in this world in that way. Let us see your invisible hand doing awesome wonders. You are a just and you are a righteous God, and we praise you and we honor you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.